Good evening, everybody, and welcome to The Strand. Um, my name is Robin, and I help direct the events here at Strand. For a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until, after over 92 years, Strand is the sole survivor still run by the Bass family, running 400 events a year, and still housing new and used books. Tonight, I am very excited to be celebrating the launch of The Hard Times, The First 40 Years, the first book from the minds behind the hard-hitting and supremely accurate website <laughs> documenting punk and hardcore culture since 2014. The first 40 years unearths the archives of punk's first decades, as well as some of its reporting from our current century. Here to discuss the shape of punk that came are Chrissy Howard, managing editor with additional bylines at Reductress, The Hairpin, Reader's Digest, and more. Bill Conway, co-founder and head writer, as well as stand-up comedian. And Matt Sankum, another co-founder and a writer for Rolling Stone, Vice, and San Francisco Weekly. I'm thrilled to have them here tonight, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming them to The Strand. Pass it down. Hi, I'm Chrissy Howard. Um, is it on? Is it working? Yeah, it's on. You're good. Um, all right. You sound great. Thanks. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but me and Matt are actually married. I um, love you, sweetie. It takes thanks. two. <laughs> um, we married back in 2002. We each had our own careers at that point, but I don't think it's that healthy to spend multiple hours away from each other when you're married. So I, so I thought that maybe we should have the same career. So I proposed writing the hard times together because in my experience, you leave someone alone, they sleep with the babysitter, <laughs> dog walker, your so cousin, true. whatever. So, <laughs> so, um. <laughs> I love you so much. No, no, I know, I love, I love you too. And every, so we're, we're better than we've ever been. That's true. But, um. So yeah, this way, doing a comedy site, he always says I'm like miserable, have no sense of humor. So I did a comedy site, proved him wrong. I always know where he is. Thank you guys so much for coming, by the way. Just wanted to say that yeah, right off the top. Thank you. I'm not sure we intro this yet, <laughs> uh, but continue. Um, yeah. Hey, I'm Matt. Um, <laughs> Aforementioned. No. I'm I'm just so I'm just so happy to be here and to be and to be next to to you. Obviously, thank you so much for for being the guardrails that mm. keeps me keeps my anger going because <laughs> anger is punk. Um, <laughs> on the subject of punk, uh, I have a lot of opinions and I've met some great people to share those opinions with. Um, one thing I'd like to do is just say P. Pulling up the system. Are you gonna spell punk? You. Uprooting He's spelling punk. the system. N, no system. No. I think K is next. K, killing the system. <laughs> right? Yeah. Punk. Give it up. Rock. Matt Sankum. Right? Thank you. You're from the Bay Area? That's true. I love the Bay. Everything about it. <laughs> How's it going? I'm straight edge comedian Bill Conway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, born and raised in Boston, uh, I was originally named uh, Matthew also, but Matt said I gotta change it, so I looked around and I saw a poster of Bill Burr hanging in my bedroom, and I was like, that's me now. Uh, never done drugs, the only thing I inject in my veins is satire comedy. <laughs> uh, how, how, what's, what's up, you guys? How are you guys doing? Great. Is this a comedy show? I don't really know. <laughs> what are we supposed to be doing? Are we riffing? Or should we, do we, are we reading from the book? Punk rock. Do you want to spell God. another word or <laughs> can we get a R. suggestion maybe? What? Right. Oh. Imposters. <laughs> we are the editors of the hard time. Oh. <gasps> Dude, all of you, get out of here. So 
Keep it moving, Showing guys. Keep, keep it moving. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, we'll take that. We'll take that. I'm going to sit on this, uh, this inside one right here. Guys, we will do some uh, fact checking. I am the real Bill. I am actually straight edge. Matt and Chrissy are married in real life, so that is true. Uh, they can tell you about their beautiful love. Um, but yeah, so that was Jeremy Kaplowitz, Dom Turek, and Michael Sivens. They're all writers for the hard times. And boy, up. did they do a great job. Am I right? <laughs> whoop, whoop, whoop. So uh, we're here to discuss this book, uh, as you know. And uh, there were some articles that were cut out of this book uh, in the early stages. So I'm going to show a couple of those to see if the editor, who is here, Kate is here, made the right choice, Kate. judging by the reaction, or the absolute wrong choice. I think she's going to be right, though. Let's find out. Let's see some of the articles cut from the book. Joey Ramone turns down scholarship to play <laughs> linebacker at USC. <laughs> all right, that was pretty all right. But I think we're good. Yeah, yes, tepid. Okay. There we go. American Bandstand producer wishes she had done more research on the Misfits. <laughs> that one was a little bit better. Huh? <laughs> we're good. Good. Catch 22 banned from Warp Tour until they've already played Warp Tour. <laughs> This one might have been more of a photo issue. We couldn't actually find a rights-free photo of Catch-22. Uh, you know, they're very stingy about their public appearance. And then we have a uh, survivor producer following Crust Punk on Island, unaware he is not contestant. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's all right. Th this one was actually mine that got cut, so I w I'm, I'm bitter about that. <laughs> Just very bitter. But, uh, but yeah, so uh, with the hard times, a lot of the problems we have with uh, photos. We don't have a lot of punk friends anymore. Chrissy, do you have any friends? No, I have yeah. no friends at all. <laughs> Matt? Not even one. See, uh, the solitary life we lead me makes it so we have no friends whatsoever. So we have to go to Shutterstock a lot to find Shutterstock punks. And I just want to show you some of the crap that we have to deal with uh, when going to stock websites to find punk people. Uh, this is the first guy that pops up when you search punk. This guy right here. <laughs> Uh, as you can see, he has a Band-Aid that says, Bad Boy. <laughs> and then a censored swear on his chest made out of <laughs> small post-it notes or Scrabble letters. I'm not <laughs> sure what that is. But that's what we have to deal with on Shutterstock. We got uh, Maltov Cocktail Lady. Uh, that's, you know, she knows she's punk because of the anarchy tea, which she probably made. Uh, this kid. <laughs> Stewed Rocks. This kid older, <laughs> much older, but still rocking. Uh, let's see. Now, this guy is the most punk one there is. This guy's legitimately punk. <laughs> He's got the middle finger. He's got the vest. Here he has opened a gift box. He doesn't care. <laughs> Fucking not punk. Here he is holding the bomb. Yeah. <laughs> but he's weary about it, because punks are weary about bombs. Here he is pointing a gun at you. <laughs> Two guns. <laughs> but he'll help you move. <laughs> he'll enjoy it the entire time. He's really, these are all photos of the same guy. Oh God, he's got a gun, all right. <laughs> Jesus Christ, but yeah. So that's kind of where we are with that. Uh, yeah. Matt, you got anything to say about photos? If that guy ever hits the news with that photo, you know, like that's the breaking news, they're going to come cracking down on punk spots all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> you know what? Who said that? Fight me outside. You know what? Don't you didn't come here to be heckled. Didn't come here to be heckled. But yeah. Want to do some reading? Yeah. Okay. What do you think? Yeah, do you guys want to read from the book? Ooh. Thank you for coming. Hey, I see someone wearing the Hard Times uh, polo back there. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> I always wanted that thing to exist ever since we started the website. That was a money pit, those shirts right there. <laughs> All right, I'm going to read you from... You ordered 4,500 of them. 4,500 shirts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you didn't even get a deal on the shirts. <laughs> Like, there wasn't, like, a cutoff point where, like, order 4500 you get about $2. So the, uh, the whole His premise... The entire garage <laughs> is filled 
with those shirts right now, so please. The whole premise of our book is uh, the first half is all new material, and the back half is some of our greatest hits. Um, not all of them are hits, per se. Some of them are uh, articles we had some sort of connection to. This is one uh, that I wanted to put in here. It's actually the first hard time story that I ever wrote. Uh, I wrote some stories for the hard times a couple years before I met Bill, who co-founded the site with me. And I wrote these stories in college when I had the idea for the website. And I showed them to some of my friends, and they said, Matt, that's a horrible idea. Uh, <laughs> no one's going to read that. Uh, you're going to get beat up. And you should not pursue your dreams. <laughs> so we had to put this story in the book. Uh, the headline is, Ban Pretty Sure It's Safe to Park Van Here Overnight. <laughs> Detroit. Embarking on their first tour, members of Clearly X Straight are pretty sure it's safe to park their van in a dark, crime-ridden alleyway overnight, sources maintained. Dude, whatever, I'm tired, and it's getting way too fucking late. Just park the damn thing, said Casey Rodriguez, the band's drummer and soon-to-be Kickstarter manager. <laughs> we'll be totally fucked if we park on the street and end up getting a ticket. At least if we park the van here near the dumpsters, nobody will, will be able to see it from the main road. Other members of the band were just as enthusiastic about leaving their equipment in a dimly lit alley in a bad part of town. Quote, in our hearts and in our minds, united, together, the only thing we need to worry about is if all this shattered glass is going to pop our tires. Front man Daniel Morgan preached to the back seat as he pulled up into the spot. Nobody will touch our stuff. Keep the faith. The Detroit Police Department had hoped their break-in area signs would keep drivers from parking their cars in areas they deem dangerous, but the program has seemingly failed to inform one key demographic, touring bands. That's actually, I, uh, I wrote that because I went on tour one time and uh, we had to park our van in a place and it, it's, there was a sign that said, break in area, don't park here. <laughs> so this article's about me. <laughs> uh, you're basically giving your gear away by parking in this neighborhood. It's probably uh, better to just leave it unlocked so at least you won't have to replace any broken windows, said Sergeant Rick Caldwell. Once they report their van was broken into, which they most certainly will, the best we can do is just offer them a map with some of the city's more popular pawn shops. Update, clearly X straight it was, is reporting via Facebook that all of their equipment and merchandise has been stolen. The estimated value of these missing items is around $350. That band that we invented for that story, Clearly X Straight, they went on to have be in several Hard Times articles, some of which made the book. Um, but yeah, so how about we give a round of applause for Chrissy Howard, and she comes and reads a piece of the book. We're not married, by the way, but thank you for that, Dom. Also, Chrissy just clapped for herself. <laughs> Hello. I'm Chrissy Howard. I'm the managing editor of The Hard Time. Uh, thank you, dear. <laughs> uh, and I chose this headline because it is the only one of mine that got accepted into the book. <laughs> I worked on this book for an entire year. We had meetings every single week, I think, sometimes twice a week. And hundreds, well, I don't know of hundreds of headlines, but dozens of headlines of mine uh, were rejected except for this one, so... I'm happy to read it, <laughs> and I'm honored to be a part of this. <laughs> Sound a little bit bitter, Chrissy. <laughs> Terrified gerbil in pet store avoiding eye contact with jackass crew. <laughs> Westchester, Pennsylvania. A local we should note that this is from the early part of the book, the, as if we existed in the 2000s. So this oh, is a blast I'm sorry. from the past here. So yeah, this is, uh, this is new. This is brand new content. Uh, this was written in the 2000s section, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this was before uh, we made it to a website. <laughs> Westchester, Pennsylvania. Thanks, Bill, also for interrupting me in the middle. You're welcome. <laughs> a local gerbil was. Did I seen mentioned Matt has a lot of shirts in his garage. <laughs> well, I can't. I can talk. <laughs> A local gerbil was seen actively averting her eyes as the cast and crew of MTV's Jackass entered the pet store she lives in. Uneasy sources confirmed. <laughs> Fuck, muttered the 899 Mongolian gerbil while attempting to build a pile of cedar chips in a far corner of her cage to hide in. <laughs> I've heard about these guys and the things that they put in places just for giggles, but I never thought this day would actually come. 
other longtime pet store residents were spotted suspiciously eyeing the raucous crew. It's not the first time I've seen this happen, recalled African Grey Parrot and unofficial store mascot Hank. About two years ago, these same boys came barreling in here and bought a blue-tailed skink that couldn't have been more than... <laughs> it wasn't even two minutes before that poor thing ended up in the wrong end of Brandon DiCamillo's dick hole, and the cameras weren't even rolling or nothing. I didn't speak up then, and I've regretted it every day since. I'm not about to make the same mistake twice, he added. Tensions were further highlighted after crew members Chris Pontius began chasing Steve-O around the store with a toilet paper tube while screaming, squeal like a pig, oink, oink. <laughs> oh, wow, okay, this might really be it, huh? Best case scenario, I end up swimming around in Preston Lacey's back sweat, the gerbil said. I didn't survive being one of four in my litter who weren't eaten by my fucking dad just to have Steve-O's ass tattoo be the last thing I witnessed. <laughs> I mean, I haven't even seen the wire yet. There's so much left to do. At press time, the gerbil was seen running past an elderly ferret on her way into a circular hamster ball, which she intends to use to make a break for it. Sorry, Mom. All right. So unlike Chrissy, I had way too many approved for this book. Um, <laughs> just uh, lousy with headlines that I got approved for this thing. So let's see. If we take a trip back uh, to the 80s, uh, the 1980s, that is, uh, Wrote a little article here. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, debate class instructor hoping Ian Mackay drops course as soon as possible. Uh, Washington. Woodrow Wilson High School debate instructor Peter Schuster vocalized his wishes that long-winded senior Ian Mackay drop the class immediately, according to exhausted teachers and administrators. I'm at my breaking point, said Schuster, visibly shaking in the teacher's lounge. He just never stops. I try to give him a softball topic like candy is delicious, and he goes on and on about human rights violations in countries that export sugar, and how if he was a supplier of candy bars, he would stay up all night packaging each one by hand. <laughs> Schuster has tried a variety of tactics in order to make the class less pleasant for the controversial student. I am not proud of this, but last week I sat him by the window and paid some other students to stand outside and smoke. Ultimately, it had no effect, said the veteran high school instructor while pouring a small bottle of whiskey into his coffee. <laughs> For the past two weeks, I've been debating which disco artists are best, and he still finds a way to turn it into a rant ag against conformity or capitalism. Students also express frustrations with Mackay's presence. Debate is during last period, so if he starts talking toward the end of class, I know I'll be late to catch the bus, said fellow student Amy Parker. Last week, we were debating about whether cats or dogs made better pets, and he ended up talking for two hours straight about how owning a pet is false imprisonment. <laughs> I ended up missing my shift at the diner and also got, almost got fired. Mackay was unfa unfazed by... Sorry, guys. I'm just emotional when reading these things. <laughs> Mackay was unfazed when confronted with the cri criticism of his debate style. Listen, it's not like I'm trying to give anyone a set of rules. I'm just debating things that are important in a world that I don't find much importance in, he said while nursing a can of Coca-Cola. If the other students can't keep, keep up, then that's their fault. Bullis School... Yeah, Bullis School in nearby Potomac, Maryland, claimed to have a similar issue with senior Henry Rollins, who, in addition to initiating long-winded debates, has also injured multiple students playing dodgeball. Uh, so, yeah, is there any uh, contributor that's here that wants to read an article of uh, theirs that made it into the book? I don't know if we discussed that, but uh, no hands going up. All right. Uh, ooh, do we know what page you're on, Mike? Yeah, all right. But do we know what page you're on? Uh, it's right, in the 70s section, and the 80s section. I think. 80s section, all right. Let's oh, there it is. Oh, Spike. There it is. Hey, not Matt, Mike. <laughs> this is called uh, Congress Passes New Law Requiring Every Punk in Every Movie to be Named Spike. <laughs> this, is from the, this is from the 80s. Washington. Congress passed a law Tuesday morning requiring Hollywood to name every vaguely punk-looking character Spike, from starring cast members to background extras, sources confirmed. Spike is clearly a bad person's name, and it's also easy to remember if the character is wearing spikes in some way, particularly on their head or face, said Representative Mitch Branquist, Republican, Iowa, IA, Iowa, yeah. Therefore, all characters should be named as such in perpetuity. The legal, blockbuster, uh, the legal blockbuster will apply to every spiky-haired, ne'er-do-well, low-budget biker, and playground bully depicted in any movie, scripted TV drama, commercial, and or after-school special to further improve viewer experiences. 
Regardless of format, this bold new law will help audiences quickly identify punk rockers on screen so elderly viewers can easily follow their favorite program storylines, Branquist explained. By leaving no question whether Spike is the bad one, our nation's older folks will have more opportunities to ask more pressing questions such as, what did he say? And doesn't she look like the girl who works at the photomat on Saturday? This baffling new requirement will also benefit the nation's squarest audiences, including parents, teachers, law enforcement, and convenience store owners, many of whom seek to spot misguided use as quickly as possible to maintain order in society at all costs. These days, with the hairspray and the denim, it's hard to tell who's a bad seed just by looking at them, so this helps, said Denver resident and concerned parent Leslie Hoff. Hollywood executives are reported to be perplexed by the announcement, yet willing to cooperate. If the nudniks in Washington want the, the next no good ruffian who crashes his motorcycle into a dweebs party to be named Spike, then I guess that's what they're going to get, said Motion Picture Association of America President Jack Valenti. We're going to, we're going to be saying goodbye to a lot of perfectly good Johnnies, aces, and pukes. But that's just the way things roll in this fickle bitch of an industry. Sweeping changes to the nation's screenplays are expected for any fictional character wearing combat boots, cartoonishly large chains, leather jackets and or metal studs, as well as anyone lacking a desire to be a positive contributor to society, like that nice Jamie Watkins boy up the street. All right, Mike. Uh, shout out that individual right there. He, uh, I met him on tour one time and he drew us this, the logo for the hard times. Yeah, graffiti art. My name is Matt. <laughs> All right, uh, another contributor who is here, Mr. Eric Navarro. I know he's around here somewhere. The uh, Warped Tour one's in the book, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> All right. The, uh, there was this headline that went all around the internet and uh, had bands talking about it on stage and had uh, the owner of Warp Tour freaking out on Twitter trying to defend himself. <laughs> and the man who caused all that trouble is this man right here, Eric Navarro. Come on up here. Uh, this is something that almost got me sued. Uh, <laughs> All Warp Tour stages moved 100 feet from audience to comply with sex offender laws. <laughs> That's been a first date convo for like two years, it rules. Uh, all right, Costa Mesa, California, or Mesa, California. Uh, this, the stages at this summer's Warp Tour will be placed 100 feet away from the all-ages venue in order to comply with the national sex offender laws, according to local festival or organizers. Uh, this measure is unfortunate, but we see no other solution, said Isaac Reeves, head of public relations for Warp Tour. We prefer to run a would we prefer to run a tour that doesn't have at least one sex offender on every stage? Of course! <laughs> but this is the music business, after all. It has a rich legacy of creeps. 2017, by the way. We had, yeah. Ugh. Maybe when pop punk and metalcore fall out of fashion, we can try again. Organizers reportedly brainstormed for hours to find a resolution that delivered the best musical experience for the consumer while protecting the underage patrons from potentially dangerous musicians. Initially, the idea was to have an all-sex offender stage, Reeves continued. <laughs> but that basically comprised 75% of the band, so it was a scheduling nightmare. <laughs> Shout out to Ed Sankum III for that joke. Uh, in addition to modifying the stages, educational measures were implemented to directly address the problem. An intern suggested we hold an ethics seminar for our musicians on how not to abuse their power as rock stars, said Warp Tour ethics advisor Jacob Parker. But no one showed up because it was scheduled at the same time as our post-show wet t-shirt contest behind the Hot Topic tent. <laughs> uh, Long-term Warp Tour stagehand Eric Dirt Welsh expressed disgust at this generation of band members taking advantage of young fans. Seriously, why can't these scumbags control themselves, Welch said while loading dozens of fake amps onto a stage. I'm a 42-year-old man who's been on this tour for 15 years, and I can definitively say that an 18-year-old girl is just as hot as a 17-year-old girl. <laughs> These bands today have no morals. <laughs> is there any other contributor? Any other contributors here that want to uh, read a piece? Anybody? Uh, hey, Kyle Earth. Oh, Kyle Earth. Here we go. Come on up, Kyle. One of our most prolific writers. 
I think Kyle has 200 wow. headlines on the website. Is that right, Kyle? I, I don't know. It's a big group project. <laughs> thank you. What am I reading? <laughs> Something you wrote. I th oh, thank you. That was very punk rock of me also to raise my hand and then say excuse me <laughs> to 100 people on the way up here. I think I want to I want to do the Jello one. That was my. Well, no, this is gonna take. Uh, it's in the front it, part of the. The front. The front of part the of the back. back. Half, yeah. Okay. All right. Are you about the airline one? Yeah, the airline one. Oh no! Oh, I went too far. Uh, so, so the thing with this, this was this uh, the second thing I ever got on the website, um, and it's also maybe the most successful thing I've ever done on the website, uh, which is a terrible way to kick things <laughs> off. Uh, it got reposted on the Dead Kennedys Facebook page, which, once you know the headline is like, ice cold of them to do that. Uh, Jello Biafra is not in that <laughs> band anymore. Also, is, is it pronounced Biafra? Yes. Thank you. 156. 156. Thanks. That's so helpful. Thank you. All right. Lucky airline passenger wins free five hour spoken word concert by Jello Biafra. <laughs> Newark, New Jersey. Unassuming airline passenger Peter, Mo Peter Monahan was treated to an energetic and unending spoken word concert from former Dead Kennedys frontman Jello Biafra while traveling on a red eye flight from San Francisco to Newark late last night. Tired bystanders report. When I went to sit down, he was in the window seat fogging up the glass and drawing crude animals claimed the exhausted Monaghan, who had no previous knowledge of the punk icon, but has since learned Biafra's opinions on topics ranging from government corruption to what constitutes authentic New York pizza. <laughs> I wanted to be polite and make small talk, so I asked Biafra where he was headed. He looked up and told me, we're all headed straight down the proverbial shithole. <laughs> and it just kind of went from there. I asked him what his job was, and he said, I blow mines for a living. Later it came up that he was in a popular punk band or something, added Monaghan. Like many on board the 11 p.m. flight, Monaghan had purchased his ticket with the hope of sleeping for most of the five-hour journey, but was instead treated to an avalanche of Biafra's wisdom, wry humor, and radical solutions. I kept trying to put it, my earbuds in, but I didn't get the opportunity, Monaghan recalled. He was on a roll all about, about all the organizations keeping society in the dark, the TSA, NSI, NSA, CIA, PMRC, GOP. It was a long list. I almost fell asleep once, but he startled me awake by pulling the Washington Post out of his back pocket to corroborate a, port about, a point about minimum wage. <laughs> he seems like a smart guy, and I actually agreed with most of what he said. God, I'm so tired, though. <laughs> As of press time, reports indicate that Biafra was preparing, to, uh, was preparing a special encore performance for one lucky airport cab driver. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yo, Dom, you want to read something? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> the hard times, you know, it started small, but it came to be a big group project, and the more people we added to it, the better it got. So that's why we're having all of our friends read stuff. Uh, I think she's in the uh, 90s or 2000s section. Okay. The American Idol headline. Here, you want to talk? Go for it. Oh, no, <laughs> <I> don't. <laughs> Hi. Um, I don't really have much to talk about. There you go. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank God. Okay, um, this is Punk's American Idol audition praised by Simon Cowell as vile chorus of dying sewer rats. <laughs> uh, Los Angeles, American Idol judge Simon Cowell took a break from his harsh criticism Sunday to commend one punk contestant's audition as a vile chorus of dying sewer rats, sources confirmed. <clears throat> this has got to be the first time an audition has been triggered my gag reflex, said Cowell. Two years ago, I listened to a woman play We Are the Champions on a flute through her stomach, but that was nothing compared to what I witnessed yesterday. American Idol hopeful and Florida resident Nick Landon recalled his excitement leading up to his performance of The Star Spangled Banner, during which he sat an upside down American flag ablaze, a stunt that his audience are hailing as the most unpatriotic, 
an unnecessary fire hazard in recent memory. <laughs> I came all the way down from Gainesville for this, explained Landon, who recently quit his band <laughs> to embark upon his own music career. After seeing what going solo did for legends like Sid Vicious and David Lee Roth, I had to give it a chance. It's clearly paying off big time. The memorable edition also drew critical acclaim from fellow judge Randy Jackson, who said, that's gonna be a fuck no for me, dog. <laughs> which quickly became the network's first use of censorship on the show. The entire performance was spastic, raved Jackson. It was like watching a fly that had been sprayed with Windex. Just being in the same room with him has left me impotent, if not totally infertile. <laughs> However, not everyone was impressed. Sparing no emotion, Paula Abdul called the performance truly adorable and gave Landon an A for effort. In between incoherent ramblings, the diminutive singer and dancer even went so far as to call the contestant mainstream material. It went better than expected, Landon said, upon being eliminated from advancing to the next round. Getting that sheet of yellow paper would have undermined my whole nonconformist and anti-authoritarian performance. I can't wait to come back next year and not make it. So uh, we've, we've been a website for five years now. We're celebrating five years in December. And uh, I just wanted to show you, uh, we used to be able to see search terms that bring, brought people to our website. So I want to call the segment, What the Actual Fuck? <laughs> why, why, why? Please stop looking at our website, please. These are actual search terms people typed into Google and then got to our website and read an article. <laughs> Party fuck man woman. <laughs> Father fucking readily. <laughs> Father fuck. There's a theme that really starts to develop. <laughs> Sex with Prince Roger Nelson. <laughs> Bruce Fulper. I don't know that one. Does anyone know who Bruce Fulper is? Hardfucked.net, <laughs> which was the original name of the website. <laughs> Facebook the Realistic Band. Punker's mom sex. <laughs> Tather fucking. Spelling mistake there. You can't even. <laughs> <laughs> Supportive dad fuck me. <laughs> Father fucking ladies. <laughs> ladies is ladies is spelled L E Y D Y S. It's the strangest spelling. Eat dead pussy. <laughs> <laughs> Japan Daddy Tumblr. <laughs> Sexual edging is hard or not. <laughs> and finally, Stud Dad shows son how to fuck babes stories. <laughs> Doesn't want to see it, just wants to read about it. <laughs> Which is more alarming when you really think about it. More alarming. But uh, at, at this point, so... Um, I want to do a little thing where we give away a copy of the book and maybe Matt will send you some merch here. But we need a volunteer from the audience to play a little game here. You have already volunteered. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, Chrissy, hand that mic over. Come on up here. Your name? Geo. All right, it was Keo? Geo. Geo, Geo. Please stand right here. Just, we're going to play an easy game here. And it's called Let's Talk About Corn. All right? <laughs> this is a very easy game. All, I'm going to bring six people up on the board. All you have to tell me is if they are a corn fan or a farmer of corn, all right? <laughs> so here we go. We got Simon, Heather, <laughs> Dusk, Amethyst, Dale, <laughs> and Mike. So just make your selection, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about each contestant, and you just tell me if they are a corn fan <laughs> or a farmer of corn, okay? <laughs> Who would you like? Um, can I hear about Dusk? Dusk, of course, great choice. Uh, Dusk believes the world is a constant dark chasm of misery and despair fed by a never-ending feeling of pure, I don't know, I, I can't read my own handwriting here, uh, but who cares? Is she a corn fan or a farmer of corn? I'm gonna go with Corn farmer. That is incorrect. No. <laughs> She's a fan of corn. She has every lyric of Freak on a Leash tattooed on her ribs, <laughs> as well as Jonathan Davis tattooed on her shoulders. So 
<laughs> All right, so we, we got five more chances here. We got five more chances. Who do we like to hear from? I'm going to go with Dale. Dale, great choice. <laughs> Dale. Dale is a season ticket Nebraska State corn husker holder <laughs> whose father invented a tire revulcanization method for tractors. Is Dale a corn fan <laughs> or a farmer of corn? Oh, I got this. Uh, farmer of corn. That is correct, yes. Yeah. Dale has won the Nebraska State Fair's Big Corn Blue Ribbon for the past eight years. This guy knows what he's doing. All right, one and one. Who would you like to see? I'm going to go with Amethyst. Ooh, excellent. Don't want to lose my cards here. Amethyst. She emancipated herself from her parents at age 16 and enters competitive vaping tournaments. <laughs> Is Amethyst a corn fan or a farmer of corn? <laughs> I'm going to go with corn fan. Ooh, I'm sorry. That is incorrect. <laughs> oh. She grows corn, but only off the cob. So it's very strange. All right. So we're, s we're still in the game here. We're still in the game. Who would you like to hear from? Can I try uh, Heather? All right, Heather. Here we go. One-handed shit here. All right. Heather owns three golden retrievers, drives a 1987 Chevy pickup, and her favorite color is plaid. Is Heather a corn fan or a farmer? You can all say it with me. Or a farmer <laughs> of corn? Uh, <laughs> going to go with corn fan. That is correct. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Heather dropped out of middle school to follow corn on OzFest in 2003. So, oh, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> We're not at the bonus round yet. <laughs> we have Simon and Mike left. Who would you like to hear from? I'm going to go with Simon. Simon is 24 years old, hates his dad, and at one time owned a pet rat. <laughs> is Simon a corn fan or a farmer of corn? I'm going to go with corn fan one more time. That is actually correct. Yes, yes. <laughs> He quit his job selling cell phone cases in the mall parking lot <laughs> to attend a book signing of Fieldy's memoir, Got the Life, My Journey of Addiction, Faith, Recovery, and Corn. So that's, <laughs> that's a fan right there. So last one, we got Mike. So Mike is a 57-year-old father of six that lives by conservative Christian values and thinks the Big Bang Theory is offensive. <laughs> <laughs> is Mike a corn fan... <laughs> Or a farmer of corn? Corn fan. That is incorrect. I am sorry. Uh, so Mike owns and operates Ohio's 17th biggest corn farm and hopes to expand into his neighbor's lot once he dies. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we're three and three. That's going to bring us. This competitive vape cloud can only mean one thing. <laughs> it's the bonus round. <laughs> so... This next person, it all comes down to this. You just tell me, is this person a corn fan or a farmer of corn? Fred Durst. <laughs> I know, I saved the toughest one for last. Gonna go with corn farmer on that one. Let's find out. That is correct. <laughs> Judging by his scatting, you have won. Uh, we'll give you a copy of the book. Uh, and then uh, stick by, we'll get your email address. Matt will send you some... some uh, <laughs> Some fucking shit. There we go. Everybody give Gio a hand. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Matt, you want to kick that off? Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you for coming out. I think we should do some uh, Q&A for uh, the three of us. Anyone have any questions? Think quick. No questions. Well, wow, you again, huh? Gio, geez. Wow. <laughs> All right, what do you got? He's trying to trade in his book for something better. <laughs> yeah. um, how did you guys come about the idea of doing, instead of a magazine or a, or a zine, for example, why did you do a, uh, online, why did you do something an online platform? So why did we start off on the internet as opposed to, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, we didn't think anybody was going to read us on the internet either. So 
It was really, do we uh, get a bunch of paper cuts at first and do it that way and have nobody read it, or bring it online and then have nobody read it? Uh, and strangely enough, people actually read it, so we were s pleasantly surprised uh, by how that turned out. So, uh, yeah, it was mainly because the internet's the only place to be these days. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, Matt, Matt did a zine prior to this called Punks, Punks, Punks. Uh, Matt, how many, uh, how many copies of that are still in circulation? Um... I know that I have like 20 at my house I couldn't sell. <laughs> if you want one, does anyone want a Punks, Punks, Punks copy? I interviewed... So he'll send you a Punks, Punks, Punks copy <laughs> Still well. no. Still no one wants them. I used to sell them for like 25 cents at uh, punk shows, but I went around saying, hey, do you want to buy a punk scene? Otherwise, no one would come to the merch table and buy them. I interviewed Ian McKay, though, and uh, he was one of the first times I started doing actual journalism because the Punks, Punks, Punks was all comedy-based. And I said, Ian, can I interview you? But it's going to be like, kind of like a goofy thing. And he said, absolutely not. You must ask me serious questions. Otherwise, I will not talk to you. <laughs> so then I became a journalist just to talk to Ian Mackay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th the funny thing about Ian Mackay is I I've also talked to him once. And he, says, he said, I have a really good sense of humor. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> I've been trying to get him on the podcast. And I've had like three phone conversations with him, each of them like longer than the next, about what we would talk about on the podcast. <laughs> I had, dude, at this point, we've done three podcasts. Yeah. What do you, he, I still haven't convinced you him, talked though. Talked to him, too, right? Tom, you talked to him, too. Tom, what do you think of Ian McKay? Funny guy? No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Tom hosts a podca podcast, Washed Up Emo, and he talked with uh, Ian, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, the guy is, is stiff, to say. See, but you sealed the deal. I couldn't do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did 45 minutes with him, and then he, he kept saying... If you're a satirical website, why would you have a non-satirical podcast? Like he didn't. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know. What do you want from me? Well, what was the thing we? Uh, he did also tell us that um, we're a pain in his ass. Um, he had sent us. He said, "Oh, the hard times. You guys do that website. That website's a pain in my ass." And he sent me. He forwarded me emails of a bunch of European hardcore kids saying, uh, "Ian, is this is this true? Has Fugazi reunited?" Based on some headlines that we had wrote. <laughs> And this long back and forth of Ian saying, like, no, it's a fake site. And then the guy would go, but is Fugazi back together? <laughs> no, it's like The Onion, back and forth, Ian McKay, a European hardcore kid. Uh, <laughs> so he was not happy when I called him. Do you have any other questions from our audience? I'm feeling someone here with a, with a dad. It starts what? with a... Do so you guys know those people? So uh. Matt is actually cousins <laughs> with John Edwards, uh, yeah. the medium. So mm -hmm. it runs in the family, this yeah. thing. Anyone? No questions? What's the uh, process? Uh, like, do you pitch, head do you pitch headlines uh, each week? Or, like, how, how do you go about that? Chrissy? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. <laughs> no, I said... Uh, <laughs> I was just asking in the process. Like, do you... Do you have like a meeting where you pitch headlines? Like, how does that go down? Yeah, we actually have a Facebook group. Um, so people send 10 headline submissions to our email address. And then if we pick up one of them, uh, we invite people to join our Facebook group. And then from there, it's sort of, uh, we call it like an online writer's room where uh, writers that are in the group just sort of pitch their headlines to that. And then if anything gets above a certain amount of attention in the group, we review those headlines every single week. Um, and that's, yeah, that's our process. So it's pretty cool. It's unlike um, any other submission process I've ever witnessed before. A lot of the other sites that I've contributed to, it's like you send 10 headlines or five headlines or whatever to an email, um, and that's it. You either get it picked up or you don't, but this is a little bit more interactive, and I feel like there's been um, some sort of workshopping that goes on in the group, and people uh, get close in the group, and yeah, it's, it's been a fun thing. Yeah, the good the good part about like the pitch group that we have where it's kind of like a democratic process is Matt and I are both straight edge so we don't get any drug references at all so when somebody pitches a funny drug reference we sit there and go I guess you know but when it, it when the group shows a lot of interest in that headline we default to that uh, Chrissy's done a lot of drugs in her life so she yeah gets, I get all the drug references yeah. I teach them yeah. <laughs> anybody else with a question in the back corner over here microphone coming to you Sam. Favorite rejected headlines? Uh, favorite rejected headlines? Ones uh, you wish you didn't have to reject. If there's uh, any you can say. I have one that I wrote that these two rejected, 
So I have to go through the same process as everyone else, which I think is unfair. I think I should be able to push my ideas you'll, you'll onto the rest why, of the group. We'll see why this applies to everybody <laughs> once he tells you this headline. Okay. The headline is man unsure if it's worth getting... Wait, okay, one second, one second. <laughs> uh, man unsure if another bite of sour candy is worth getting hand all sticky again. S so punk. Oh, yeah. Wow. Reminds me of going to shows when I was 16. Yeah. Oh, so real, Matt. Jesus Christ. Candy headlines. Do you have one? <laughs> the other thing that I pushed through on the group, uh, more successfully than the candy headline, is I'm a really big fan of that rumor that went around that uh, Marilyn Manson removed one of his rib cages to uh, give himself blowjobs. And so whenever someone pitches a spin on that, I just like filibuster the editorial yeah. meeting until it goes on the website. And if you look at our website, you, we could have our own category based on just those jokes. Whenever somebody pitches one of those, Matt takes his shirt off and swings it around his head like, home run, baby, here yeah. we go. It's, uh, Do you have a headline that you wrote that we, you really liked that we didn't like? No, I don't like anything I pitch. So it's, uh, no, that's not true. He really liked this pitch about Oatly. Oh, yeah. Which right. is this vegan milk yeah, stuff. Yeah, we, we did run. So where, when <laughs> I, where I live in Los Angeles, there was a huge oat leash. I'm, the, I'm a vegan guy. I have to mention that um, by law that I'm vegan. Uh, wow, listen to that applause, huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, hey, compassion is so awful. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, but Oatly is the only good uh, milk alternative that's... Uh, Almond milk tastes like battery acid. Soy milk is disgusting. Oatly is great. Uh, there was a shortage in Los Angeles where people were selling Oatly for $200 on eBay, like a carton of it. So I would go to like Whole Foods or whatever, and I would get eight at a time and lug those back to my house and just have my fridge filled with Oatly. So uh, turns out it wasn't a shortage anywhere else in the country except uh, Los Angeles. Uh, so nobody really got the joke. But Af After Bill explained this, I went over to his house. Six or seven big cartons of oatly in there yeah really weird when i go home there's six waiting for me at home right now and Delicious. every place i've gone to see it in new york i almost instinctively buy it even though i'm just gonna like have it at my hotel I'm like, what am i doing with this i don't even have cereal any other questions for us is this about oatly by any chance because <laughs> okay what other uh, artist or band reactions can you share about the guy from alien ant farm e emailed me pissed mm -hmm. he was really upset uh, Chrissy actually just found the email earlier today because we were thinking about that. Um, yeah, we. what was the headline that we wrote? Uh, Alien Ant Farm, unsure if they can still play that Michael Jackson song or something yeah. like that. And he emailed us, why would you quote me things I never said, stuff my band never did, explain, this, explain yourself to me right now. <laughs> then I laughed. Ten minutes go by and he goes, Someone filled me in. Okay, whatever. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I think he signed off the email like, are you guys a joke? And then the next one was like, yeah, you're a joke. Yeah. You know, I was like, wait, are you saying that like as, oh, no, yeah, you guys are a joke. Or you're a fucking joke. I, I still don't know. But if anybody from Alien Ant Farm's here, fight me outside. We've got a, a writer. His name is John Danick. And he wrote a headline uh, that said, um, no effects as linoleum wins Floor Trends Magazine's best song 25th year in a row. I love uh, how you, I love how you finish my sentences, baby. No, it's so cute. Stop. Uh, okay. Stop. So it's a uh, Floor Trends Magazine actually emailed us legal letter demanding we take it down right away because it was creating brand confusion. Apparently, the real Floor Trends Magazine top 25 songs of the year was uh, getting clouded by our fake one. <laughs> Um, and most people go, wait, Floor Trends Magazine is a real thing? And yes, it is. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, great, it's a great periodical. So uh, we laughed, and we told them to fuck off, and then they blocked John on Twitter. And that was <laughs> it. Yeah. Uh, Do you ever have anyone that's not pissed when you write about them? Yeah, a lot of people, uh, like, uh, we did a New Found Glory headline recently that was New Found Glory, new album, uh, just about crazy girls that take 50% of your money in divorce settlement or something like that. And the guy, Chad, that plays guitar for them, shared it and was like, oh, we've made it. We made it to the hard times. I was like, oh, we've been listening to New Found Glory since I was 16. Uh, that was cool. Uh, yeah, you made it, uh, finally. So, yeah. we, we made fun of how you're slightly misogynistic. Uh, slightly. Um, but, uh, but yeah, a lot of times people have a good sense of humor about it, uh, which is good. Uh, but it's more fun when they don't. Uh, yeah. 
the Get Up Kids, uh, I'm, what is his name? Matt, Matt Pryor. Pryor. Yeah, he had a good sense of humor about it. I guess we wrote two headlines. We published two articles about them making fun of them. And he posted something saying, like, they've, they've shit on us twice and they've not even asked me to be on their podcast. And now he's on the podcast. He's <laughs> on an upcoming episode of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, that, that was, uh, we did, um, like, all ages Get Up Kids show, like, doesn't need to be or something <laughs> like that. Or Still, still 21, 21 and plus. Up. Yeah. And the other one was, like, guy refers to a uh, 20-year-old album as their new one. And it was something to write home about, which came out in 1999. Um, which was just true to my life because I was like, does anything exist after something to write home about, Tom? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's good when people have a sense of humor about it. Uh, any other questions? All right, we're done, Tom. <laughs> All right so uh, I guess uh, we'll be sitting at this table for a little bit. If anybody wants us to uh, deface their books and uh, ruin the resale value of them, we'll gladly do that for anybody. We got markers there, and uh, come say hello. Uh, we'll be hanging out. Heather, how are you? Uh, good to see you. Didn't, didn't say anything. she had a video on the Hard Times today where she fell in love with the Hard Times book. So Heather, nice to see you. Uh, Please keep it going for Heather. But and, uh, uh, please but also keep it going uh, for the three of these guys and the hard times. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we will indeed be signing books right over here at this table. We got some cool gold sharpies for the cool black pages in the book. So I'm sure that'll look really good, or it'll look really weird. I didn't test them. We'll find out. If you don't have a copy of the book, you can buy them over at the registers on this floor. If you do have a copy of the book, we're going to try and line up going that way, starting right here. Uh, again, thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you guys for being with us, and have a great night.